We hope you enjoyed Forever First, Rise to the Finals, courtesy of our good friends at the Canadian Premier League. I am Gareth Wheeler. Welcome to the Review Show Special as we recap what all played out just over five months ago in the great cities of Hamilton and Calgary, which led to Forge becoming the first ever Canadian Premier League champion. Gareth Wheeler with you here tonight, alongside one soccer analyst, Oliver Platt, and the one soccer expert, self-anointed <laughs> Mr. Kurt Larson. Gentlemen, uh, Anoint anointed by Jeff Paulus, please. Anointed by FC Edmonton head coach Jeff Paulus. Okay, well, taken over and owned and right. turned into an absolutely own monster right now. Um, it, it's kind of funny, like spinning back um, not only five months, but really the full calendar year from where we started, where we ended up today. I, I thought it was a proper flashback and, and, and reminder of everything that these players, these teams, the fans, coast to coast to coast, experienced over the course of the first season of uh, Canadian Premier League football. Uh, Kurt, maybe just your thoughts off the top. Just watching that, what did it bring back for you? Yeah, it brought back memories of you know the first the first final for me, really. I mean, that's what the entire storyline building up to this was about was you know two of the best teams all season long um, competing in a final. And I think what made this final particularly special for me, why I was most excited, um, was less about the quality on display. And for me, it's the storyline about the general dislike between these two clubs. Um, some might call it a healthy a healthy dislike. Mm. I'm not sure how healthy it actually was because um, there were just a lot of tussles back and forth throughout the season. So the most intriguing thing for me was that these two teams didn't like each other. And that showed throughout the season. And finally, we got a chance to see uh, who would reign uh, supreme. Ollie, same question for you. What came back for you? Yeah, well, I think what Kurt said there was kind of part of what I thought was the most remarkable thing about the first season was that we really started to see real club cultures take root in, in these CPL cities, you know, and, and Hamilton and Calgary perhaps more so than or, or as much as any, any other CPL city. Um, you know, you saw fan bases developing, different aspects of these clubs, different parts of their identity developing, and, and to see, you know, two groups of supporters that were so dedicated to their teams by the times by the time these finals came around, um, in the space of just six months of football, I, I thought was a pretty amazing thing and, and kind of speaks to, to the potential of this league and mm. the potential of this country. See, watch, watching it back for me, I just watching these the, the footage play out and the way the games played out, there really wasn't much between these teams, was there? And that wasn't just over the course of the two legs of the Canadian Premier League final, but they played nine times over the course of the calendar year and cup competition as well. No mat match was settled by more than a goal. I mean, that, that's remarkable that one team or, or another couldn't take more advantage of, of one another, even up until the death. And I'm sure we'll get into it over the next half hour or so. Um, a call doesn't go Cavalry's way. We saw it right at the end there, a penalty shout, which could have meant that these two sides could have very well gone to penalties. So the, the, the competitive nature between the two, the two teams, Kurt, it's not just that they didn't like one another. It was tactical and physical and mental battles all the way through. Yeah, I want to hear from from Tommy on that, on the the general dislike uh, between these two teams. I know all these coaches get along, and that they all talk. Uh, they saw each other at the draft, um, but at the same time, like like you like you said, there were so many close battles. We remember back to the Canadian Championship and what happened there with the scuffle at the end of the first leg of that series, and and and, and that brought so much more um, interest to the Canadian Championship this year. Um, but what, what you mentioned there also, it brought back memories of the dying moments of that second leg, when in my opinion, and we saw it there right before Ford scored the series clinching goal, in my opinion, a penalty decision was missed, did not go Calvary's way. Uh, and I think that was one of the biggest decisions in this entire finals that we didn't really spend that much time talking about in the post-game show after the finals because we didn't have a good replay of it <laughs> at the time. Yeah. We get home from Calgary, and then we look back and we say, I think that was a penalty. At least I, I thought it was a penalty. Oliver Platt doesn't think it was a penalty, which is absurd. I thought it was a penalty. From a broadcast perspective, it's very difficult as well. Not only our perspective at Spruce Meadows at Atco Field, you're kind of off in the corner. So it was basically right in front of us. Didn't have the best angle. But when, when the potential match-winning goal that settles 
a, you know, a, a league championship plays out immediately, like right after that. Obviously, you're trying to capture the goal that moment, reflect on whether it was a penalty show or not. There was a lot going on at the same time, Ollie. There was a lot going on, yeah. Um, I, I think it was... I wouldn't say I didn't mm. think it was a penalty completely. I thought it would have been a very difficult one to give in, in the circumstances. And for the same reasons, it was difficult for us to digest. You know, the referees had a, had a lot to deal with at that point in the game as well. But um, I think it really was just, as you highlighted with those stats, it highlighted how little there was between the two teams throughout the whole course of the season. Um, two teams that played in quite different ways, I think, but, but just proved to be so evenly matched over, you know, I think it was nine or ten matches. Um, and, and look, I don't mean to take anything away from Forge, but, you know, a couple of things break differently and then we could be talking about a different champion. You know, that's the nature of football and, and particularly the nature of knockout football. And it, it was remarkable how, uh, how evenly matched these two teams were. Perfect segue. Let's bring in the Canadian Premier League Coach of the Year, Mr. Tommy Wielden. Wheels up, Tommy Wielden Jr. How are you? Uh, good, thank you. Um, it's been a, quite a long off-season, but when you start looking through that... Um, documentary again it brings back a, a lot of memories and not just listen it's a painful way to finish a final uh there's no there's no escape in that um it is fine margins that really are called here called there but um what, what it does really highlight is i think what we've done collectively um not just the two teams that went to the final you guys in the media the fan from coast to coast were, were incredible um and i think that's what really I miss now because we're just embarking on the on the preseason and getting back into it, and and I know the the fans out there are, are missing that connection, and it was evident to see. But I mean, the finals, you know, they're very cagey affairs. Was it the two best games? Not at all. Um, but what you did see was two tactically astute teams that really shut each other out. That um, I'd say it was one piece of brilliance. That <clears throat> we decided the two teams over 120 minutes, and that was from Tristan Borges. I mean, the lad won MVP of the season. Um, for a reason, he, he big players come up big in big moments, and uh, and he did that. And really, you know, whether it's a penalty or not, you know, I'm always going to be biased. I thought it was, but my opinion doesn't matter. It's that penalty, opinion. penalty, Tommy. <laughs> it's a penalty. I, I know that's what I said. It, I think it was a penalty. <laughs> your opinion, my opinion doesn't matter because the history books will show um, Schwanier scored in the 93rd minute, um, and that's all that will be remembered. So. For us, we just got to use it as fuel for for the following uh, season. Um, but I mean, hats off, you know, Hamilton really were the ones that started the season. Do we want to lose them? Absolutely not. But you know, credit where it's due. They're the champions now, and and they get to put the gold crest on their sleeve. Tommy, did did you go back and watch the game immediately? <laughs> it take some time. Not, oh, no, no, not, not immediately. <laughs> no, that was a that's a that's a. It's weird because. After every single game, um, you know, myself, Martin, Jordan, the, Leon, the coaching staff, we generally watch within 24 hours of the game finishing every single game we play, um, often two or three times as we prepare for the next one. Um, watching that one, I would say the first time I watched it was January this year. What did you think about it when you watched it back? <laughs> um, I think it was just the, the reverse of the first leg. You know, we had a ton of the possession and, you know, we're restricted to crosses or long range efforts or set plays. Um, and I think what we, what we realized is just, we needed a bit of magic, you know, and, and uh, like I said about the Borges goal, he had that magic when it counted. Um, we didn't. And uh, that's something that, you know, we've, we've put in part in our off season recruitment um, to make that happen because, you know, we scored more goals than anybody else through the course of the 28-game uh, season. You know, we played two MLS sides very close to one-goal games and only one one team other than Montreal Impact have beat us at home, and that's Forge. So, you know, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but um, we know when it mattered. Um, we didn't have a big moment, uh, and, and and that's for us to change. Tommy, we're four or five months, you know, down the road now from that finals. I think, you know, can you reflect back on it and just tell us what your thinking was just going into that first leg? Did you want to split it up into, you know, two different games? We want to approach this away leg like this, and then we want to get back to Spruce Meadows in this kind of shape so that we can tackle that game like this. Can you just give us what your approach was going into to the first leg? Yeah, the thing you heard in the um, my, my pregame speech at uh, uh, Tim Hortons Field was, you know, there's 120 minutes there, sorry, 180 minutes to be played. Um, and what we wanted to do was chunk it up in uh, six 15-minute games um, because we knew that it'd be cagey first 15. 
then the next 15 was getting into it and then you know you really push before half time and then you reevaluate um for us um we also had a secondary moment because Tim Hortons field is like a wind tunnel you know it's you know got two terrific stands either side but either end is wide open so what we did was we said look if we had the wind we're going high up the field we're not letting them breathe we're not letting them get out if it's not then you know what we're going to protect the space in behind because um you know they're quite quick up top you know they got you know Borges will drop into pockets and get it Beck is very astute with his passing uh, we didn't want to make the pitch as big as it needed to be um all that changes when um, Joe Waterman gets sent off and then suddenly the half-time team talk comes about, right, let's get out of here alive. Um, let's make it a second leg um, back in Calgary. And then by the time, you know, Borges gets sent off, we have to reevaluate again. We bring in, uh, you know, Brownie. We bring in Sergio a little bit late. Um, but by then, I think the emotional energy had been zapped out of the team. I didn't think we, um, we passed the ball as well as we usually do um, and have that calmness under chaos. Um, but you know what? Walking away from it, Having not played great, but defended, I think we defended brilliantly. You look at, you know, when you watch the game back again, I know they've hit the crossbar um, from set plays and a free kick and, um, you know, Becker's 30-yard drive, which is an exceptional hit. They haven't really created too much in, in open play. Um, so we, we took that as a, as a positive saying, right, you know what? It's a one-goal game now going into Spruce Meadows. And, and we felt confident that we would score back there. I want to also welcome in John Molinero. Sorry, John, I kept you out of this discussion long enough. That's okay. I no, just we're... let you collect your thoughts and then you can just jump in and share. Hey, John. Oh, good. good, how are you, man? Uh, so, Tommy, what I'm sort of interested in knowing is with regards to the Waterman red card, I mean, looking back on it now, I mean, what do you think? And maybe you can just talk about what that meant for you, for your team going to the second leg, not having, you know, one of your better defenders. Yeah, I mean, again, it's decisions, isn't it? Because... Where's his, where's his natural movement? He's going to slide. I've yet to see a defender slide with his arms next to him. I don't think he's intensely onboarded, but I know the laws of the game are you know, there to be read, and, but it's an interpretation of it. For me, actually, you know, when you look at decisions, we actually thought that ball was out over the far side, but the documentary showed an angle we'd not seen yet, and it wasn't. So you know, that clears up a, a what if for us. But oh, before that moment, uh, Oliver Minitel's fa fouled in the middle of the park on the 45th minute or something which it's a free kick and everything changes and we reevaluate half time. But you know, like I said, it's uh, I felt harsh for Joel, you know, fortunately this is football, you know, he's, uh, he's gone from being the villain in the final and getting sent off and feeling like crap, but then he's now got the move that his ability has earned him and uh, he's gone off to Montreal. So, you know, football has swings and roundabouts and, um, you know, we were gutted to lose him, but we had to reevaluate half time and bring uh, Jay into the picture. Joel's feeling just fine. We talked to him uh, earlier this week. I think he's doing just fine, Tommy. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, you got something? Uh, yeah, Tommy, Tommy, as we've said, the, the margins are so fine, and, and I appreciate that it's easy to, to speculate on these things uh, after the fact. But when you look back on it now, before either game, is there anything you would have done differently if, if you could have the, the final again? Yeah, I mean, we've looked at different things. Um, you, know, you know, for us... Uh, we, we were very, we we're, were a different team when we have Elijah Adekubi or Mara Stacchio, even Joel Waterman in the base of our midfield because it, it creates a, you know, a point guard, if you will. And uh, we, I felt we were better with it. You know, Elijah was unfortunate getting injured just prior, as was Sergio Camargo. He came back for the Edmonton game, the last uh, uh, game of the season, scored, but, you know, we were still feeling things. Elijah wasn't fully fit. Um, and Mara Stacchio, you know, he'd blown his ACL. So we had to change a little bit um we went with more of industry in midfield you know with uh with ledge and uh bush is a double pivot um i think we're better when we had a single pivot like i said with elijah we'd like to have that we'd like to have had a fully fit sergio camargo in there but you know what this is football you're never really gonna have a you know a, a full side and we thrived off of rotation through the season so for us it was a case of next man up and um you know that's what we felt we'd do but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. If if I had those players fit, I'd have played them. I didn't, so we didn't. So we can't really look back at that too much. You mentioned Gareth, you mentioned Gareth can I just get one in? Can I just yeah, get one in, Gareth? Yeah. I, yeah. I just I just want to make sure we get this one in. I know we're welcoming Bobby here in in, in a few minutes. Um, but but Tommy, for for me, you know, this league was always going to be taken serious based on how it competed in the Canadian Championship. And maybe this is an unfair question, but I'm, I'm known to throw a few of these out there occasionally. Um, your guys' victory over the Vancouver Whitecaps, which to you would have been more important, winning the CPL finals 
or that victory over Vancouver, which kind of cemented your place in CPL lore as the first team to take down, the first CPL team to take down an MLS side in a two-legged affair? Uh, great question. Um, in the infancy, like the, the Canadian Premier League finals are always going to be there. You know, our, mm. our plan is always to try and win it. I think it said even in the documentary, we wanted to see it as a, as a treble. You know, the spring season was, was short. We won that. Uh, we won the fall season. We wanted to take that serious and we wanted to take the final series. And I think we did. You know, we, we didn't give them an inch, but like I said, there was a bit of quality from Tristan Borges that was the difference. Um, but I think the bigger picture, you know, and I'll take it back because every time I had an interview and all through the Canadian Championship, you know, whether it was TSM Vancouver or TSM Montreal or whoever was interviewing us, you know, Canadian press, I kept hearing this reference about you know, Division Two football and coming out of Division Two. And yeah. I correct them. I said, no, no, no. I said, this is this is Canada's Tier One league. Whilst we may not have the same salary cap that you know a more established league has, we've got ability across this league, and it's shown. You know, it showed when Forge went into into Concacaf and you know played Olympia, as as, as Montreal have found out. It showed when York played against Montreal and uh, Halifax played against Ottawa. So for us, it was about gaining respect uh, for the league. So in Year One. I think the biggest value, uh, and this is only my opinion, was beating the Whitecaps. My opinion too. Just let you know. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was such like it wasn't just the the second leg, the first leg, second leg. It, it, it was incredible to watch that play out, Tommy. And perhaps your team peaked too early, and perhaps your team heading into next season is better suited. The fact that there isn't a spring season and a fall season, because you mentioned it, you had to rotate your squad. Players are coming in and out. You were tinkering with your team. You had a difficult job, although you had very good players. You had to keep them motivated and focused on the task at hand, even though you really had the, the supporter shield wrapped up. So do you think that this new format will be better for your team in this coming season? Uh, possibly. I mean, I don't think we peaked too early. I think we got into a log jam where we, um, we, we played seven games in 21 days, and that was with uh, Montreal Impact in there. And then we played Edmonton two days later, which was ridiculous. But... You know, that was just, you know, we had to adapt and overcome. Um, but for us, uh, we didn't peak too too early. I think we won eight out of the last nine games um, going into the final. So we felt confident going to the final. The only team that beat us there was actually uh, Forge, who we'd played twice. But, I mean, I think there was an element of changing things around. When we went there, we played with a false nine and rotated Sergio and Ollie and Jordan Brown out wide. And, you know, we, we looked at uh, Jose Escalante as an inverted winger. We looked at a couple of things. Um and we got some answers there, and we uh, and that helped us prepare for the finals. But I think the full season, you know, that's how the rest of the world, or majority of the rest of the world, you take Argentina and Mexico aside with their aperture clausel. I think it's what people understand. You know, for me, I, I want to see there, there should be a credit because you know, I think the the long haul should be, you know, seen as as quite the distance run. It's like winning a gold medal in the decathlon. But only everyone remembers the hundred meter sprint right. finishing second, you know, because I think there needs to be, you know, uh, uh, something for the winners. And whether that's somebody else next year, I'll still hold true because I'm a purist. It's the long race, and it, every game should matter. You shouldn't go right. I'm gonna, you know, play a weekend side here because I'm worried about the finals or the playoffs. You play your strongest team available with uh, what you have at hand, and then when you hit the finals, you you you, you reevaluate. But uh, you know, let's let's not, let's not take away as well from you know we we were the league winners and we're proud of that. But you know, Forge are the championship winners and credit to Bobby and his players and his staff and they were worthy winners. So you know that's that's the beauty of this rivalry. Any parting questions for Tommy, guys? Yeah, I, I have one on a bit more of a positive note, Tommy. Um, you know, that day at Spruce Meadows, the second leg was was an incredible day. The crowd packed house in, in the stadium. Um, you could really see how the team and, and the league has caught on in Calgary. Uh, what do, what does that mean to you? That the way that bond kind of developed between between yourselves and, and the fans who were there that day. I, I think we've got a great connection with our fans, and it starts all the way from you know the foot soldiers, your wraparound for 109 into the 400s, and and our ownership group. It's it's brilliant. Not many people know that, but our ownership group will sit in the actual fan session section. They've got season tickets in there, and Tom and Linda go and sit in there. It's um. You know, we've got a great connection. You know, just over Christmas, we went to a Foot Soldiers event and, and, and chatted. And, you know, these were events that back in the day when I had the Foothills PDL side, there was five or six of them. Now, you know, there's a couple of hundred. But, you know, you're seeing that from coast to coast. And honestly, it's it's been an incredible journey to be a part of. I'm just very, very thankful that I get to play my part in helping change the landscape of Canadian football.
You've had some extra time, Tommy, of course, ahead of this new season. Any more custom suits, a new style, a new look for 2020 <laughs> coming our way? Well, I'm open to suggestions, Gareth. I mean, you've okay. got you're quite a lively dresser as well. So, um... <laughs> hey, that comes with advantages as well as distinct disadvantages as well. So, listen, it uh, never goes out of fashion dressing like a gentleman. I think it was something that I you know, wanted to, to, to bring to the league and, and have respect for, for, for the role that I was playing in it and, the, and our team and our organization. So you know, I'm glad it, glad it caught on. Much to be proud of uh, over the course of the inaugural season. Congratulations again to you, Tommy. Looking forward to seeing you, hopefully in the not-so-distant future, back on the field, okay? Okay, thanks for having us on, guys. Cheers. Thanks, and, uh, just, Good message, sorry, just one one thing and just a message yeah. to all the fans out there. I know everyone's kind of suffering and struggling with uh, no football, but uh, we'll come back stronger. We'll do the right thing and stay safe. Awesome. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, Tommy Wilden, Jr., head coach, manager. Cavalry FC joining us okay. here on the review show. Bobby Smirniotis okay. uh, coming up in a few moments' time. A uh, gentleman. I wanted to get this yours. in. Where do you want yeah, to go? I want. Yeah, I wanted. I wanted to wait for him to leave before I said this. I, I hate, absolutely hate, when Tommy brings up how uh, Cavalry were the uh, apparent league winners, and Forge were merely the championship winners or whatever that means. Listen, Forge FC are the CPL champions. This was established at the start of the league. This is how we crown the champions. We crown the champions. Whoever wins the two league finals is our champion. Listen, Forge down the stretch completely packed it in. They didn't want to give anything away. They were playing different lineups and trying guys in different places, trying to throw Calvary off. Uh, as much as I like the club out in Calgary, I mean, you got to say that, that Forge are the CPL champions. Uh, they're the CPL league winners not cavalry. Anyone have anything to guys, say to that? Guys? Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a, it's the drawback of the league structure for me that, w that we can say that, right? That Forge kind of through the last week, few weeks of the season and we're chopping and changing the lineup and not wanting to show their hands. Um, you know, the fact that we had a, a few weeks of that kind of, to me is, is the one drawback of, of the way we structure these things, right? With, with the regular season and then the finals. Yeah, but it's structured better now. I mean, we got to say that, right? So, you know, hope, hopefully that structure can be maintained and we can have the three-team playoff. And, you know, there's a little nugget out there for the league winner because you, you know, probably get to host a one-game final. We don't know yet for sure. Uh, um, so uh, that'll be a little bit better in, 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 in year two. So, uh, but Forge, congratulations. You are the league winner. You're the championship winner. You're everything. Well, it's perfect timing because the head coach <laughs> of the Canadian Premier League Championship side from the great city of Hamilton, Bobby Smirionis, now joining us here in the Forever First Rise to the Finals review show special. Uh, Bobby, congratulations again. Uh, what did you think about what you just saw just a few moments ago? Yeah, first and foremost, that's a great introduction, Kurt. If you want to keep on rolling with it, <laughs> more comments, no problem. Uh, we'll uh, take it. Um, yeah, just uh, just watching back over that last half an hour. Obviously, it's uh, it's great memories. It's memories that will uh, will stick with us uh, for a long time. You know, it's the one thing we talked about. All of us in this league, um, from teams to coaches, players, everyone, uh, we're creating a sense of of history. And you can only do something uh, for the first time once. And uh, gladly, we were able to do that in 2019. That scarf looks pretty good back there, Bobby. Do you walk around the town with it on all the time as well? Yeah, no, it's it's gone up in the home office and it's uh, it's staying there for a while. Is that, custom, is that custom made? What is that? Definitely not custom made. That's, uh, oh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bobby, when you were watching uh, watching uh, the documentary, what came to mind for you? What memories came rushing back aside from winning the championship? But was there a moment that stood out for you more than anything else? I think the biggest thing is just looking at the atmosphere around it, you know, the atmosphere around both games, you know, the, the great idea that we had a celebration of football on our hands, you know, a celebration of football that in 2018 didn't exist. Um, you had uh, over uh, 10,000 people at Tim Hortons Field, um, 6,000 at Spruce Meadows, two great uh, atmospheres, two great environments. And what I thought, and I think this is contrary to some of the things I've heard, I thought were two excellent matches. Uh, I thought they were excellent because of the tactical components of the matches. I know sometimes that's what gets us going as coaches. That's what gets us uh, brewing on, on how we're going to go about challenging ourselves and doing that. And we had two teams up to that point that played seven matches against each other. Um, so we knew we had to be on our game. We knew and how we had to prepare. And uh, 
And I think that's one of the things we did very well going back weeks in before the finals is really setting a pretty good plan on how we're going to take those two games off. I'm, I'm going to open up the floor to the guys and they can take it away from here. I just had one thing I wanted to ask. 18 shots in that first leg. And I came out of Tim Hortons Field thinking, Bobby, I, I wonder if that will come back to haunt you come the second leg. And you talk about those tactical adjustments. You just decided to start Johnny Grant in a much more advanced role than typically we saw Johnny play um, over the course of the season. Was that key to your victory, just making that one maybe subtle, not so subtle move and, and, and just playing in a completely different way for the away yeah. leg? Yeah, we had a clear uh, tactical plan on playing at Spruce Meadows. We knew it was, it was one of the only fields, the only field in the league that we couldn't uh, put our stamp that we usually want to put on the game. You know, field conditions, we had played there about three weeks earlier, so the field was frozen, and it made things a little bit difficult. We also uh, wanted to uh, to move them in a certain way on the field, and adding Johnny Grant in there, I think, allowed us to do that. And I think in the end, it worked out. When we look back at the match, we look back at where the controlled chances came from. I've told right. myself, I've told myself this is the last time I'm going to talk about the Tristan Borges, Jay Wielden, Lazier red card incident. Uh, but I want your, I want your final opinion on it. Um, do you think Tristan Borges uh, was in a way targeted uh, in the second half of that first leg in order to try and to try and even things up? Was was Jay Wielding going in with a little something extra to try and provoke a reaction from Tristan Borges, a reaction the referee eventually bought and sent off your player for? Yeah, I don't know if it's a, if it's a Tristan Borges thing. I, I know that, uh, you know, Cavalry plays with a lot of intensity, so they'll go into some of the challenges uh, as quite heavily. So I don't want to say, you know, it was uh, intended to be done. Um, so I think, you know, it was a, it was a very hard challenge in, in midfield. Two players got uh, intertwined with each other. They came separate, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. But I'd say it's, it more comes down to that. And we saw those challenges in all the games that we played, you know, in some of the midfield battles and, and center backs really, you know, trying to be forceful, especially with players with their back to the ball. But I think it was one of those. Was it excessive? Uh, that's football. Bobby, you mentioned the quality of the pitch before. And, like, what sort of struck me about it was, you know, the day before I, when we were all in Calgary, I think we were all kind of standing out on the pitch. and. I was just stunned by how, you know, poor it was, to be perfectly honest. It was like a cow patch. So I'm interested to hear what you thought about how, how did it play and how did that affect your team in the second leg? Yeah, I mean, uh, the one thing we had is uh, about three weeks before we went and played that uh, infamous match with the uh, frozen pitch and uh, the blow torches at the, at the back end. So it gave us kind of an idea of what we may be facing. Um, so we prepared the team a little bit for that in that week, where if these are the conditions, this is what we have to make our, our game uh, kind of look like you know that day before like you said we stepped onto it um we started passing the ball and it just wouldn't stay on the ground right. uh, so from that end you know it was very cemented in how we wanted to do things um how we wanted to kind of stifle some things uh, that we knew cavalry was going to do the way they like to play at home uh, and where they wanted to use their their advantages and i think uh, the guys uh, went at it very perfectly and we had the you know probably and we see it in the documentary we have one you know top end chance by malanga in that, in that second game, and that is it. You know, everything else is, is calculated. It's a cross. It's come into a zone where we put the right amount of guys to defend them, and I thought we did an excellent job from there. Just two shots on target. Sorry. Remarkable. Just two shots on target against you in, in the away leg, you know, of a yeah. final. Bobby, that speaks volumes. Yeah, over the two games, I thought that, you know, that's what we did. Uh, we did excellent. You know, in the first game, I thought we were, we were fantastic. The first game had its ups and downs. You know, we were up to uh, – playing 11 against uh, 10 for, I believe it was about 28 minutes or so uh, until Borges got the card. But uh, even going through the game, we we're still playing on the front foot. So we came out of that first game very positive. You know, that, that was the most important thing. You know, um, I had those chats, you know, coach, you, you guys missed a lot of opportunities. Uh, do you think that'll come back to haunt you? I think if you start the game and you say, I come out of a uh, first leg winning 1-0 at home, not giving up the away goal, you put yourself in a good chance to go and take care of business on the road. Bobby, we were just talking to Tommy and, and he said similarly that he really enjoyed the tactical battle of the finals and it was incredibly evenly matched. Um, for him, the, the difference between the two teams was, was just the quality of, of Tristan Borges. Um, is, is that something that you would agree with, that that kind of player really stands out in, in those kind of, um, you know, smaller two-legged affairs? Yeah, I think on, on the outside, it's an easy player to, to point out. Uh, when you work with your team uh, every day, and I'm not saying this because he's gone from us uh, right now, but he knew this when he was here. It was, uh, 
it was part of uh, everyone, you know, everyone's ability to to play in those games and, and to do what they need to do. And uh, guys like Becker, who I think, uh, you know, was possibly our most valuable player in the year. Yep. Absolutely. Not as, you know, you look at Nanko's second half of the season. Uh, the guys really, really stepped up. And yeah, of course, you need those those moments of brilliance. And mm-hmm. uh, and we had a few in that first leg um, with a couple of the crossbars. We had two open field chances with that, with Anthony Olvac as well. But of course, uh, when a player is hot, uh, a player is going to be able to do the business. And that's and that's gorgeous. And, you know, the one thing we look at is we miss a penalty in the uh, 40th minute. And after that missed penalty, we create three fantastic opportunities. Uh, so I think that showed a lot of character in the group itself. Um, with those boots and set piece, with Novak hitting a half volley, and then the goal coming in the uh, in the 46 minute. Bobby, I uh, <clears throat> a couple of guys you didn't mention there, who uh, at least Oliver Platt and I thought were fantastic in the second leg were were David Edgar and and Daniel Crutzen. Daniel Crutzen, uh, we we feel is one of the best. You know, I, I don't want to call him a prospect, but somebody who could go on and play at Another level, David Edgar for me, surprised me. I wasn't sure how much he had left in the tank, just given, um, you know, where he was a few years ago. Um, but what did you see from them in the final? And were they as key as Oliver Platt and I think they were? Just in cleaning everything up that came inside the area. There were only a few moments uh, where maybe Don Malonga got on the end of something. But other than that, it seemed like Crutzen and Edgar really just, everything was headed clear. Yeah, uh, yeah, listen, we're all biased towards our teams, and you'll hear it from uh, from all the coaches, but I think, uh, you know, when those two guys got settled playing together, uh, Edgar and Crutzen, we had the best uh, central defending tandem in the league. You know, a lot of good experience uh, with Edgar, knowing how to position, know how to command the back line, keeping, this, uh, keeping things simple. And then you look at Crutzen, for me, he's the best ball playing center back in the league. And uh, then you go to the finals and, and seeing how the game plan was, especially in that second leg. And uh, and they were excellent. They were excellent in their in their zones and just how they handled things. And yeah, apart from the one very clear chance from Malanga, where uh, where Edgar maybe lost them on his back end, you know, we were we were there. And those guys uh, gave us a lot. And uh, you know, you mentioned it. You know, uh, Edgar came into the team in late July, started playing in August. Uh, hadn't played football in a long time. Um, you know, coming off of different injuries, and it was it was a matter of getting him in. But it was also a matter of how you managed him in, in getting to this point. You know, we knew a few things as a club going into what was going to be the finals. Um, one, we knew we had to qualify to get there. So to qualify, you had to win one of the uh, – or be first in one of the seasons or, or be second. Um, we knew that winning in the fall would give us an opportunity to host the second leg at home. Uh, but unfortunately, in August, we knew that that was never going to happen because of the CFL schedule. And yeah. so we, we also knew a few things a little bit earlier on. Um, so in, in going back to Edgar, you have to know how to manage some of the players going into those final two games um, because for us, the final two games was the way you're going to lift the trophy. You know, the Canadian Premier League, the commissioner and everyone told us this year, there's one trophy and it gets given out after two legs. This year, they're telling us, I believe it's going to be three teams who qualify to play for an ability to win a championship. So I thought that was important to a little bit of our, of our strategy is, is how we manage some of these guys down the stretch and it showed, you know, we went into two of our last three games of the season losing to Cavalry in York. Uh, but we look at those games, uh, and they're played without uh, David Edgar, without Dom Samuel, without uh, Johnny Grant. Um, and the list kind of goes uh, goes on a couple of the games without Borges in the lineup in Cavalry and against York. So we really had to manage that looking at what the ultimate goal was for us. And uh, if you put a trophy in front of me or you put a championship in front of me, I'm going to do my best to go after that. And, and that's what we had to deal with. So we had to manage guys like Ed, Edgar like that. And I yep. think uh, yeah. did a great job and kept him sharp um, for that in this season. That was his big season to come back and get games. And I think it, uh, it worked out for us in the end. That, that was an interesting aspect of it was that Cavalry did have such a settled starting 11 and, and you guys changed things around maybe a little more. And I even look at two players like Awura and Nanko, who I thought were absolutely fantastic in the finals. I was counting up earlier, and they only played together as a left back and a left winger, I think, three times during the regular season. Uh, just what can you say about how those partnerships were, were so effective? Yeah, we knew we had partnerships to start the year in different places. The thing was, and I, I think I mentioned it in the, in, the doc, in the doc there, that the final game was the first game where we had basically everyone in our lineup yeah. physically ready to play. Yeah. Um, so we had to move things around. We, you know, we went on a great stretch, and 
I think it was from July 14th till October 10th. Is we had played 18 games, including CONCACAF League, and we only lost one game in those 18, uh, the one game away to Olympia. But if we look at our lineup, it's constantly changing, you know, because we had one guy mixed up. Uh, we had another guy who we wanted to make sure was getting better. So we constantly had to move those around. And some of those guys that got moved a lot was a guy like Kwame Alua, who started the season playing left back. Then we saw him for a good stretch playing in the midfield where he was excellent, you know, in CONCACAF League play and so on. Um, but then when we started getting to the tail end of the season, it was, it was really trying to get these guys in the best place uh, that gives us an opportunity based on the opponent of where to play. And we saw that partnership with uh, Alua and Anko, you know, pay dividends in the last few games of the season. Bobby, I got, I got, I'm going to let uh, the other guys get in here, but I got to ask this one too, because I'm, uh, I'm representing Forge fans here a little bit. Uh, haven't made too many changes this off season. Uh, why would a championship winning team need to make changes, right? However, you have lost the MVP of the league. And from where I'm sitting, uh, there isn't another player of that caliber on the roster right now. So who steps up and replaces Tristan Borges in 2020? Yeah, so there's two ways of looking at that. One is uh, you look at the, uh, the common effort from within the group, and there's a few players that I think can do it. And the second uh, thing is, is you'll see some quality coming into the group uh, via the the transfer market, you know, something that we're we're working on, and we got a lot of things right in the first year. Um, hopefully, that was a good thing. Uh, hopefully, it can continue. But the most important thing is when you're adding to a squad like this, is that you're adding increased quality. I think that's the most important thing. Sure, you're not just going to get a player to get a player um, to plug a hole. You want that guy to come in that could possibly take uh, Borges's role, uh, and also a couple of other guys that make sure it makes our team better. Um, because for me, it's important. Uh, depth is very important. We use our players and we use our players um, the most, uh, I believe, in the league, uh, not out of just necessity, but using them the most. Um, so I think that still is a common theme. You know, this year we're going to have to compete in the Canadian Championship. We're going to have to compete in CONCACAF League. You know, we're starting uh, early in the Canadian Championship. So that means we've got those extra games because, you know, our ambition is always to win in those games. Our ambition is to go a different round. Uh, when we look at CONCACAF League, you know, we – it was a new experience for us. It was a new experience for everyone. We went that second round, but we know if we go that one click further, you know, we may be creating even bigger history by playing the big boys, you know, in February. Yeah. Uh, that's how close it is. So it's important for us. We've got a squad that we put a plan around for two years. So we've got this team here. Now it's a matter of how can we increase the quality in the squad to allow us to go out and play on all these fronts. Well, Olympia has done well. Sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to the cavalry thing real quick um, because you guys play. I, the series was so tight throughout the season. I mean, the games were very competitive, and there was only I think whenever one of your teams won a game it was only by one goal. Yeah. I just wanted to get your theory as to why do you think the, the series was so close? Why they why the two teams played each other so tight? Yeah, I think first you had a lot of quality on the pitch. I think uh, you know everything we can talk about coaching tactics. Uh, but, but uh, a lot of us will also say uh, that it comes down to the quality. I think the quality on the pitch, the teams were very balanced. And I don't mean playing against each other. I mean, they were balanced amongst the teams themselves. Uh, you had good goaltending, very good defending, good midfielders. You look across each line and you've got quality players on the pitch and you also have quality depth. Um, and what that allowed to do was, you know, always to uh, tug a little bit back and forth. I think you also sometimes saw two different types of game being played at Tim's Horton's Tim Hortons Field, as opposed to going to Spruce Meadows. Um, so that changed up things, and that, I think, sometimes allowed each team to bring out the best of themselves um, in, the, in those situations. Well, you know, I think, I think that's what it came down to. And, uh, you know, you look at it and you say, you know, we've, we've won five games um, against them, and, yeah, it's five one-nil games. It's, uh, it's, it's five shutouts. It's uh, five games. And we also know over the nine games, we've scored in every game. Um, I can tell you the one thing we had a lot of and uh, not just just myself, um, because I'm a very humble person, even amongst my group. But I could see going into the finals, uh, there was a lot of confidence in the group. There was a lot of confidence in knowing the opponent, uh, knowing what works against them, and knowing what doesn't work against them. And uh, a lot of the players will say this, it was two of the most relaxed weeks they had all season. Uh, and I think that gave me just sitting back, looking at the guys, uh, gave me a very uh, even bigger confidence just looking at them and saying that the guys were prepared to go into this. And yeah, in the end, it works out. Bobby, did some of that come from the CONCACAF League? Um, because I noticed a difference afterwards. Your team was just that much more sharp. 
even though it made your schedule that much more difficult. And look, you fell to a team in Olympia that eliminated the MLS Cup champion Seattle Sounders in the CONCACAF Champions League and has beat Montreal in the first leg of their competition as well. I just wonder what that experience meant for your team. Yeah, I thought it was uh, I thought it was excellent. You know, first round we go back to the first round with Antigua, and I think that was the beginning of it, because now it's it's the total unknown. It's who are these guys and who are we to them? Um, getting down there for the first time in Guatemala, um, you know, guys just hearing different things about Concacaf. Uh, and remember, in in the games against Antigua, nine of our what was it seven of our starters the year before were playing in League One Ontario. Uh, nine of them were Canadians. We played with two foreigners, with guys like Cisse and so on, uh, injured. Then you go into that next round, and you say, okay, Olympia. And uh, Olympia rings a bell in my ear, just knowing the CONCACAF region, and you say, okay, we've, we've got a powerhouse on our hands. Uh, you put a game plan in place, and you say, the one thing we don't do is lose at Tim Hortons Field. doesn't matter what else happens. We don't lose. Uh, we give our crowd, we give our city what everyone wants. You know, when we talk about Champions League in Europe, we talk about those European nights. You know, if you've lived in Europe and uh, – You've been around the Champions League environment. That's that's a special evening on Wednesday night um, at the 8:30 or 9:30, wherever you are, and you know it's 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 something that you can't explain unless you're there. And and that's what I wanted our crowd to get out of us. That's what I wanted to make sure we we're able to do. We get that one nothing victory, and then we know okay, we can go down here. Uh, but we're playing a difficult team. Uh, it was quite the experience. You're playing in a stadium um, that I think fits about 35,000. It's about it was about 1,500 military. Wow. <laughs> I, I can tell you it probably would have been better playing in front of 35,000. Uh, <laughs> and it's not just for the military. It was just the, the environment of nothing, you know, yeah. no sounds, nothing going on, just 22 guys on the field. It, w- it was, it was quite a different feeling, but yeah, of course that gave us the ability to know, Hey, we're doing it on this pitch. We should be able to do this week in week out. And we had been doing it for a good portion of things. You know, when I look back at our 2019 season, you know, I look at our first four games, and we've lost uh, is it seven points. That's the difference to our season. That's it. Uh, but we also knew after that, because I thought the first 10 games is, was very important. If uh, whoever can win those first two games gives themselves an opportunity to just think a little bit further down the road. That, that was there. Once we got past that, the most important thing was just keep on playing good football. Yeah, we finished first, we finished second, whatever it is. We get ourselves into the final. We get ourselves there healthy. We get ourselves there without card problems, which we did have when we came down it down down to it. We had Dom Samuel missing in the first game. Um, our last two or three games of the season, we don't play Novak and we don't play uh, Zajac because they're on card difficulties. So we keep them out of the games in order to prepare for that. So we had to take a lot of things into consideration. Anything Bills, else, guys? Before we let Bobby go, I was I was going to ask you I was going to ask you per- permission for one more wheels. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to, Bobby, I, I know there's a fun guy in there somewhere. You're always so straight-faced with us and never giving anything away. I want to know what you did after you won at Spruce Meadows, and I want to know who was the biggest partier on Forge FC. All right, so small little uh, secret. Maybe it's known or not known, but when I came into to media, I had a gash of about a few centimeters in the back of the head here. Um, <laughs> From uh, from the Gatorade uh, bin, but no, dude, listen, we had, we had a lot of fun. That's, that's what you do this for. Uh, all these years, I've worked in developing players, and my trophies were in seeing players move on to the professional level. Um, at this end, it's about lifting a cup. Um, you try and find where those cups are, and you do your damn best to try and get to them um, for the importance it makes for your club, your club culture, your players, uh, and your fans. So we definitely enjoyed that. And from the team, I can tell you guys, these guys enjoyed it uh, dearly, and they enjoyed it for many weeks. You know, there was a. I saw Give me one guy. Show. Give me I one guy. I Kyle Becker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he throws it out there. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I'm not Definitely surprised. Hey, uh, B- Bobby, thanks for your time. We learned a lot tonight, including, and I always thought you were of Greek heritage. Apparently, you're Dutch. Total football. We wear orange. <laughs> How we play. <laughs> uh, thanks. 2004, I visited them for the first time. It's Dutch season one. Very good, Bobby. Uh, thanks so much for your time tonight. Congratulations again, and hopefully we'll be seeing you uh, in the not so distant future. Okay. Thanks, guys, and just one thanks. last message from me. I know it's a it's a difficult time for everyone uh, in the world and involved, uh, obviously, in sports. We've got a lot of things going on. 
Um, these things are great so that we can keep our fans uh, and everyone involved in this league, you know, busy with sport and thinking about some uh, some positive moments. But everyone stay safe, stay healthy. We look forward to seeing you soon. You Thanks, too, man. Bobby. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, Canadian Premier League champion, manager and head coach, Bobby Smirniotis of Forge FC. Uh, we'll wrap this up tonight. I want to go around the table for any final thoughts from Kurt, Ollie, and John. And then I also want to hear from you, and I want to ask this question. Once Bobby drops off this, because I, I, he might be frozen in space here on my screen. Oh, yeah, he's just um, trying to listen in. He's listening in. <laughs> but, I know. What I want to know from each one of you is which team is in better position to make it back to a Canadian Premier League final in 2020 or whenever we pick up football based upon the way their teams are constructed. Is it Forge or is it Cavalry, which will most likely be in the next documentary, um, subtly second. That's what we'll call it. Not forever <laughs> first, but subtly second. I'm going with, uh, I'm going to stay with Cavalry just because I, I, I find them to be a little more blue collar. Uh, if, if, if Forge picks up some injuries and how are they going to deal with the loss of Tristan Borges, I still think they're the best two teams in the league, but I'm going with Cavalry because I, I do think they also have the best defense in the league. All those guys are returning. It's just a team that knows how to grind and get back to a final. So I'm going with Cavalry in the best position to get back between those two teams. I'm going to give Forge a tiny edge. Um, I think both clubs are in a really good position going forwards, and, and I, I'd be very surprised if they're not uh, in that three-team playoff next year. Um, but I look at this Forge squad, and I look at how many players I think still have more to give uh, and still could take another step in their careers. And, and I think maybe you look at Kyle Becker and Dom Samuel and think, you know, they, they were outstanding last season and maybe they won't be better next year. But I think there's so many other players in the squad, whether it's a Wua, Nanko, Jonsson, Grant, so many guys who I still think have more, you know, I, I think can be even better next season. So yeah. uh, for that reason, I, I give them a tiny edge, but but Cavalry, I think will be very happy with where that, they're at too. I'm pretty much in agreement with Oliver. I think, I, I don't think, I think they're both well-placed to get back to the final. I think they've both done an excellent job of keeping the core of their teams in place. Obviously, there's been some defections, but that's always the case. But I don't know, something about the Forge team where I just think, as always, Oliver said, and I agree, I think there's more that you know, you'll know you see from guys like Becker and Daniel Kutzen, who I think is the best defender in the league. I thought I think he was just a wonderful player last year and was really a bit of an unheralded hero. And I think we could see even more from him this year. Um, but I'm just really impressed with you know how to, or Bobby really kept the core of the team in place pretty much, and there there wasn't a great deal of uh, off season sort of moves, and um, I think he, the, I think they're just probably just a slight slightly tiny bit better, a little bit uh, better advanced now than Forges or than Cavalry is at the moment. And for the other six clubs in the Canadian Premier League, there's your benchmark. I mean, these two sides. Both had development teams before. There might have been some groundwork that was laid. Uh, no excuses here in the upcoming season. Plenty of time for each and every club to adjust and try to reach the high watermark that both these sides um, reached over the course of the first season. Uh, we went long tonight. Sorry, Kurt, I kept you away from 90 Day for Fiance for long enough. <laughs> it's my, it's go. not even about that, man. I got I got two pizzas behind me here that I ordered about an hour ago for the viewing party, so I got to hit those. I've just been staring at the Cheerios for the last 45 minutes <laughs> over your left hand shoulder. They're for the baby. They're for the baby. He loves them. So if you want a Kurt Larson-type body, Cheerios, bananas, and pizza, apparently. <laughs> That's the diet. Uh, anything else, guys? You're good? You're good? No, nah, it's yeah, it's fine. It's I, I just I'm hoping this this 2020 season gets going because for me, we talked about two teams tonight, but the most intriguing part of this upcoming season, whenever it starts, is everyone else and how do these teams get better? And we think some of these teams are much, much, much improved. So hopefully, they can approach Calvary and Forge and challenge uh, challenge to get to a, a playoff at least. A uh, couple reminders: you want to stay locked on. Um, on our website, on uh, on One Soccer, we have plenty of content coming your way um, as we ride out this stoppage in play uh, tomorrow on the Hangout, the Canadian Premier League One Soccer Hangout. Marco Bustos is joining the show. What time's that on, guys? Tomorrow. Uh, oh, you have Eastern, I think. You have some explaining to do, Marco Bustos. <laughs> Calling out Bustos. And John Bellinero, <laughs> director of content. Uh, uh, of Canadian Premier League soccer. What's coming on, going on in the website? 
Yeah, we're just continuing to produce uh, content every day, pretty much. A lot of uh, more Ottawa signings probably going to be announced this week. So I would say be on the lookout for that because we'll have all the latest on that. Good stuff. Uh, Ollie, final word? Final word? I, I, I just need some soccer to watch after watching that uh, documentary. And talk <laughs> the to Belarus some... League, buddy. Get the Belarus League on, man. <laughs> yeah. You're fine. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the Belarus League is going to do it for me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to... Uh, you know, getting, getting everyone safe and outside and, and playing some soccer again. Good stuff. Uh, great job, all three of you tonight. He is the one soccer expert, Kurt Larson, Oliver Platt, one soccer analyst, and John Molinaro, director of content of the Canadian Premier League website. Uh, I'm Gareth Wheeler, reminding you to subscribe to our YouTube page and follow us across our social channels. I actually have a new show that's coming up this week as well on Thursday. Looking forward to that. More details in the works. On behalf of John, Ollie, Kurt, Kyle, Armin, who else am I missing? <laughs> Cast of Hunt. Everybody, give it a, give it a shout. Just keep going. Wheels up. Uh, thanks for joining us here tonight. All right. Thanks, buddy.